Welcome to Momentum Investing, property investing made easy. One of the world's top podcasts on property investing, bringing you the top experts in the field so you can learn firsthand what it takes to create passive income and take control over your financial future. Welcome, Momentum Investor. We have a very exciting show for you here today. Our guest, Simon Daz, is a a very experienced landlord with over 10 years of experience and a serial entrepreneur who runs multiple companies in the property space. He owns everything from a sourcing agency to a mortgage and creative finance broker, project management firm, lettings agency. So he can essentially help you with every part of the property journey. We have a lot we can learn from Simon and I'm very excited that we have him here as our guest and I can promise you'll get a lot of value out of this episode. In addition, I have some really cool news. We've just launched a new feature that you can find on the Momentum Podcast website. It's the MomentumInvestingPodcast.com. There, you can now go, if you scroll to the bottom of the page, you can now leave us a voice note. So what does that mean? Well, that means that you can now ask us a question live right through the website, which will allow us to bring it with us to our interviews with the speakers, play your recording live on air, and the speaker will answer your question directly. So that way we'll be able to show you exactly what your, the speakers say to your question and how you can best get your results you're looking for. So we're very excited about that. So go to the MomentumInvestingPodcast.com and you can leave us a message and we'll answer that question. Well now, without any further ado, let's get into the interview with Simon Daz so you can get all that incredible knowledge from someone who's literally done it all in property. Welcome. I'm here with uh, Simon Daz. Welcome, Simon. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me on to your podcast. Looking yeah, forward. we're so happy to have you here. We're really excited to get to know a little what's what's happening in the property market, what's happening with lending, what's going on with the letting side. I mean, you got your fingers into kind of all parts of the property business right now. Yes, absolutely. Um, I've been in property management and lettings for nearly a decade. I've got my own portfolio of Vitalet and HMO. Um, we were we should have been breaking ground on a ground up development on the first of April, but that's been uh, delayed due to the coronavirus. Um, and then we do the finance and the sourcing as well. So there's you know there's a group of companies that I'm director of, and and between. The various companies we um, we offer quite a wide ranging solution for property investors really so yeah I do see a lot of different sides of the market absolutely yeah that's why we wanted to get you on kind of get your your two cents of what's what's happening so I start, thought since most of the listeners here most of our community are investors themselves I was thinking let's let's look at the sourcing uh, to begin with and kind of see what what are you seeing as challenges but also opportunities and and what investors are saying right now okay so obviously there's a very large external influence that's shaking the marketplace at the moment in in terms of (laughs) covid19 um in the uk here we're at three and a half four weeks into the lockdown for want of a, a better way of putting it um I think that needs putting into perspective, actually. Um, But obviously, it's early days. Um, It's been a dramatic change very, very quickly and very suddenly. So the first reaction, broadly speaking, across the market has been uh, tread with caution. Mm -hmm. You know, lots of people have gone, we don't know what this is. We don't know what this means. Let's draw back. Um, and while that is a sensible thing to do and, and you have to take stock at times like this, um, there's also an undercurrent of opportunism. Um, lots of people um, trying to close the deals that they had going before uh, before everything changed. Um, and that's really positive. And, and people I've seen, the majority of people continuing on, if they're two thirds of the way through completing a deal. I've seen people continuing on um, at the market value. And, you know, most people aren't kind of going back and and trying to renegotiate. They're kind of fulfilling on their word. 
Generally, yes. Generally, less. Maybe that's the type of people I work with. Um, <laughs> but I think there's a lot of sense in thinking, well, this is dramatic and it's unprecedented, but realistically it's short-lived in terms of the length of a property investment. Yeah. So we invest in property for a minimum of five years, realistically, but usually it's a 10 to 20 year plan for property investment. Um, there's going to be dips during that 10 or 20 years. And, you know, and this is one of them. So overall, if the deal still stacks today, if you think you've got the tenants that you need and it's going to cash flow okay for you, then most of the investors that I'm speaking with are thinking of the longer term picture and continuing on. Um, I love that. I mean, most experienced investors, that's how they look at property anyway. It's its the long-term view. And you kind of see that quickly when you're talking to new investors, how they talk about, you know, getting into a deal and out of deal quick and, you know, how it's that short term. But that's what we love. That's why we talk about momentum investing. That's precisely what we mean is over a 10-year period, you have the capital appreciation, you have the cash flow, you have that whole value increase. But what what are you seeing on kind of new deals coming in? Are are, are new deals being found? What are, what can you say about them? Yes, I mean there's there's opportunity out there. Um, you know, I've got a few deals that I've been negotiating uh, on for a while. Um, I've seen deals returning to the table that were were right. apparently were being fulfilled elsewhere. So you know, some people are coming back and and having the finance business as well i've got a number of clients who were looking for lending a while ago on projects and they have sort of slipped through mm -hmm. and they've rang me back up saying this this deal's come back live now mm -hmm. so people are sort of you turning and coming back to to things and ultimately you know the landscape is trickier at the moment mainly due to the practicalities and the infrastructure um surrounding property acquisition in terms of all the different partners you need to bring together viewings valuations all these things have got trickier um but a lot of people are finding a way to get their deals done anyway and, and that's the sort of persistence and the adaptability that you need whilst investing in property what would you say to an investor would you uh, I mean, would you recommend them to take the step back and wait it out, or or do you see that it's it's time to get in now? What's kind of your with with all the parts that you're seeing? What are you seeing? Mm. Well, there's not a straight answer for for the market as a whole for for every investor. Everyone is different. Everyone's circumstances are different. Um, I'd say you know, don't as always, don't be spending what you can't afford to lose. You know, um, but but take into account the long-term picture. And if you can get a deal completed and you know that you can service any debt on that deal or you can make the return that you need over the next three to six months, um, if, you, if you are confident that you can cover three to six months, then, then crack on because there are more people withdrawing from the market, which means you have a better opportunity to close, um, to close the deals that are around um, I think it's a little bit too early to say, jump in, you know, markets dipped and, and make the most of it. Um, I think there will be a dip. Um, it's not really noticeable right now because it's like the market's frozen. It's, it's stopped um, as opposed to it fluctuating. It's, it's kind of on pause. And until um, we're allowed out of our houses again and business can return to some semblance of normality. We won't really understand the full effect. Mm. Um, you've got to, you've got to hedge your bets. Really. I'd say, I'd say don't throw everything at it right now, but if you have, if you are cash rich, then find a good deal or two because they are around and you won't have much competition reassess on a, weekly basis because things are changing that quickly right now um so i think you've just got to be open-minded um do your due diligence as normal and um and think of the long-term picture and if you are in a position now to acquire property um if you can get the deal done and make those pieces of the puzzle come together whilst others may be struggling then then go for it because um, you are ultimately up against less competition, which means better deals to be had. 
I'm thinking too, is one of the, one of the signs we always can use, uh, I mean, as a thermometer of the market is obviously the lenders. And uh, two episodes ago, I interviewed uh, Richard Shepard here on this show. And uh, he, he had a lot of uh, thoughts and, you know, where the banking industry is going with, you know, the Bank of England lowering the rates, but at the same time, mortgage lenders actually raising their rates. Uh, what, what are you seeing as, as kind of a niche lender in, in more of the bridging and development space? What are, what are private lenders doing right now? Yeah, so obviously I uh, my finance brokerage is looking at alternative finance, so bridging, development, refurbishment products, um, property finance for investors and developers. So there's some quite versatile products in there. And what we're seeing is that 90% of lenders are open for business in our sector. Um, <laughs> The majority, if not all, have reduced their loan to values. Um, a lot of that is to do with not being able to get decent valuations done. Mm. So one of the big stumbling blocks at the, blocks at the moment is getting valuations completed. And right. we're managing to get some done um, on land, on vacant properties. We've got some surveyors who will go out as long as there's no tenant in the property at that time. And obviously the tenant would have to be comfortable as well obviously of, of observing social distancing, physical distancing measures. Um, so what we're seeing is um, all of our lenders have got increased workload because people who currently have debt with them are ringing them up and saying, the market's changed. I can't, most people can't carry on with their projects as they were doing. Mm. So they're asking for extensions or reduced rates of interest for a little while to help them out. So that's a new workload coming in to the organization. They're then at reduced capacity because either they're having to furlough some staff whilst they figure out what's going on, or they are moving internal systems externally. Uh, I've spoken to one lender in the last couple of weeks who's been spent £180,000 on laptops and other equipment just so that their staff could get out of the workplace. Oh, right. So right. Up. People still working, but into their own homes rather than in the office. Exactly. And setting up that infrastructure in itself is taking is a huge additional demand on the organization. Oh, the yeah, the, so they've got increased awesome. workload yeah. and reduced capacity. Um, and whilst they want to lend and want to get money out the door, they've got to take these factors into account. So that's effectively forcing them into this position where they have to be a little more cautious, um, only fund if it makes perfect sense. You know, their appetite for risk has been reduced a bit. But ultimately, if you've got a good deal and you've got enough equity to put in, the lending's still there and, and they are finding a way. Right. Um, I would say it's it's a bit of a market correction. We've seen lenders going up to 85, 90% loan to value on bridging. That's not naturally how bridging should be used and rates of 0.4% a month, that's not natural for bridging. So it might be a bit of a correction over this time. And Right, uh, so you think the loan to value, how far are you seeing it going down? I mean, so far, obviously this is changing week by week. So when this airs, this response won't be relevant, but it's still interesting to kind of see where we're at. Yeah, so sort of three and a half, four weeks into our um, partial lockdown, which it's not a complete lockdown. We're, we're allowed out for necessary things. Mm. Um, but a month or so into that, we're seeing loan to values have reduced generally by about 10%. So people who were lending at 75% will probably be closer to 65 um, and and so on. Um, rates, some have stayed completely the same. Quite a few lenders have upped their rates a little bit, um, particularly if something is a little more tricky. We had a, a deal um, instructed on Thursday, which is four days ago, and um, that was had a flying freehold, which would have normally not been a problem to most of our lenders because it was it was only a small part of the property that's above a hairdresser's. Mm. Um, but the lenders that we could find to do it decided to, charge a slightly increased rate, which is one way of them reducing their risk. Of course. For those who don't know who are listening to the show, can you quickly just uh, explain what a flying freehold is? 
Yes. Uh, so a freehold is when you buy a property and you own the ground that it's on and all the bricks and everything above. What you often get in apartments, for instance, is you'll buy a leasehold property where you don't actually own the ground that it's on and you don't own the communal areas. So that's uh, a leasehold. Now, a flying freehold is a freehold property, but part of that property is sitting above another property which you don't own. So in this case, we've got a terrace property that extends outwards above a hairdresser's. So the property owner doesn't own the hairdressers and therefore it's classed as a flying freehold. It's an element of risk because you don't own the, the ground that this property sat on. You have no real say over what goes on in that other part of the property. Right. And obviously the lender then sees that increases their risk and they, they're making a correction. Are you, are you seeing a lot of this, uh, the correction, is it because of mainly that they don't know that they're unsure of the valuations or is it an, an overall insecurity with the market or what is it that's causing them to lower their loan to values and, and raise the rates? It's, it's a mixture. Um, some lenders are using desktop valuations mm -hmm. and so they're naturally just saying 10% lower loan to value because we haven't been able to get into the property and view sure. it. Again, for those who don't know, a desktop valuation is essentially a, a surveyor doesn't go and views. They sit at their desk and they check uh, comparables to give you a valuation. Exactly. And they might have some up-to-date photographs to go on and they might not. So it's, um, it's a riskier way of doing it. It's essentially, they've not been and visited yeah. the property and been inside. So, you know, so that is um, risk management based on the fact that the valuation is less reliable. Right. Um, they just give lesser lending, which means if they were wrong with the valuation, well, at least we didn't give them as much money. So there's still probably some equity there. Exactly that. It's all risk management. Um, and in terms of market uncertainty, yes, there's absolutely an element of that coming in. Um, it filters down from the big banks. So when you've got the likes of, you know, some of the biggest mortgage providers out there or residential mortgages, buy to let mortgages that are servicing 100,000 customers. If they turn around and say, we're not going to lend for the next two or three weeks, mm. um, it sends shockwaves through the market. Yeah. Um, we've seen that from some of the big institutions. And, and a lot of it is to do with the fact that they are now receiving tens of thousands of phone calls of people asking for mortgage repayment holidays. Mm. So they physically can't keep up with the demand. Mm. Their current clients are their most important. So they've just had to say, we can't prioritize new business. Mm. But then you see a headline in a tabloid saying banks have stopped lending to mortgage borrowers and suddenly the whole culture and the whole the whole community is spread. spread. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. The, the mortgage holiday, that's an interesting question too, is are you seeing that as because the the you know the landlords are having trouble get rents in or is it more a fact of they know they can get a, a mortgage holiday so they may so they make that phone call and take advantage of the situation not not that i'm saying it's a bad idea but you know where where is the market going well you know i've got the, a lettings business we're not very big we manage about 100 properties altogether that's 100 tenants paying rent um we've probably had 3 out of 100 Mm -hmm. uh, informers, tenants inform us that they can't pay the rent this month or that they'll have to pay reduced rent. So that's not a huge impact. Um, I think a lot of it is someone tells you you can have three months of paying your mortgage. Yeah. yeah. Um, whilst th there's chaos in the air and everything's a little bit unsettling, well, you know, if you've got four or five properties, then those those mortgage holidays could add up to quite a few thousand pounds in your cash flow over the next couple of months. So uh, I think a lot of it is, right, the opportunity is there to take a break off paying my mortgage. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm going to do that. Um, you've got to weigh up the odds because there are caveats to it. You will end up paying more overall when you pay your mortgage back. 
Mm. Um, it's just a repayment holiday. They're still charging you interest during that time. So right, so they're not actually letting you. It's not you're you're not getting let off of paying your interest. It's just you no. can wait a couple months and then you're all of a sudden having to kind of catch up on that. Or it's it's being exactly principal. Exactly. So your mortgage repayment might go up by 10, 20, 30 pounds a month for the rest of your mortgage. So you've got to weigh that up, really. Is, is it worthwhile? Um, f- for most people, it probably is. Mm. Um, because, you know, because of the uncertainty, it's a good chance to, to build a bit of a cash buffer up in your bank. If you can do that, um, then uh, you're in a stronger position, aren't you? Yeah, I think that's a good segue into your lettings business too. So, so far you're seeing about a 3% or so are, are not able to pay, uh, pay their full rent. So uh, mm. what have you seen overall going on in kind of the, the renters market? Okay. So, you know, we're managing around about a hundred properties at the minute. At any one time, we tend to have two or three vacancies. Um, so we've, we've got, a number of properties that we're advertising at the minute. I think I think it might be four. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them we did viewings, observing social distancing. So we opened a door, let people go and walk in, and then we filled in paperwork over the internet, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've had applications. We've we've managed to get a new tenant into one of the properties. Um, I think ultimately, if you need to move house now, then the virus is is not really changing that. Um, So people are allowed to move if they have to. But obviously, if you were just thinking about, um, I want a bit of a bigger place, then those type of people who are moving, not because of necessity, but because of desire, um, those type of people just will will put it on pause for a couple of months because it's, it's difficult. So we've maybe got, an extra one or two properties um, vacant possibly because of this. Um, and it'll just take a little longer to to get those tenants in, you know, getting up to date gas safety certificates. There's, there's less plumbers mm-hmm. working. Yeah. Um, there's, it's amazing how many things are affected. Mm-hmm. Um, it's when you get into the details. That's why we hire you guys as letting agents instead of having to do it ourselves. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's, um, that's, <laughs> I wasn't thinking when I decided to set up a lettings business, <laughs> you get all of the headaches, all of the problems, but what a, um, what a great learning experience though, because you see every side of property management, you know, from the tenant's perspective, the landlord's perspective, the maintenance side, the, the trades perspective, you, you get the whole lot. So it's, it's a great experience, but it's, um, yeah, there's a lot of different challenges. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little about your journey. How did you how did you get to this point where you're sourcing, you're doing mortgages, you're letting? I mean, you're you're literally doing everything right now. What? How did you kind of start and get into all this? Well, ultimately, I'm an accidental landlord. That's where it started. Um, when I was 23, my mum passed away. I was at uni, and me and my brother inherited this little terraced property in Yorkshire. Uh, We had the option to sell it, have a nice holiday, you know, get over the grief of losing our mother and, you know, pay off a few student debts. Um, But something told me that that was the wrong thing to do. And I managed to convince my brother that that was the wrong thing to do. So I borrowed a little bit of money out of it and refurbished it and learned a lot about, you know, just the basic trades, you know, basic electrics, tiling basic plumbing, all those bits and pieces. I did a lot in that house. Um, and so got a bit of a bug from it, saw it, saw an opportunity there, thought, you know, make the most of a bad situation. And, you know, we've got this, this house with, with, with this equity in it that I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have at 23, 24 years old otherwise. So, I decided to try and turn that into a business and and me and my wife bought another property together and and we got a couple more. I just thought, well, I need to keep all this separate to like our working, you know, our working income. And, um, and I said, well, I'll set up a lettings business on paper and maybe I'll take on one or two clients. I had some friends who were looking to possibly, 
uh, buy a property. And so then, then suddenly I was sourcing because I was getting a good return on my investment here in Morecambe Bay in Lancashire. Um, we moved here specifically to invest in property. So we'd done a lot of homework before buying our first buy to let here. And then, um, and then people saw me making a good return and said, can you do this for me? I was like, well, yes, I can. Um, I'll save you a lot of time, a lot of work. Uh, you pay me a fee and you know and I'll I'll help you to buy this property and I'll manage the refurbishment and then I'll manage it through my lettings business so it just naturally became part of my offering this was seven years ago probably I sourced my first property and then as it built up um, I started to get more interest from different types of investors um, and so it grew I was then asked because people in my network knew that I was working with quite a few investors to buy property. I, I was asked to raise some money for a private healthcare facility and also for some green energy projects. So I went to my investors who were all used to investing in bricks and mortar and started asking about these things and they were all a bit cautious. So it led me to explore the alternative finance market. Um, I went looking for money all over the world. I went to Dubai, I went to Marbella, I went to the Isle of Man, I went to London, Manchester, uh, and connected with a huge amount of financiers from small family-run businesses to bigger alternative um, challenger banks and things like that. And, um, and so all of the pieces of the puzzle just sort of came together um, and it was it was two years ago that I started the finance brokerage um, I'd launched the investment company uh, properly a year or so before that um, but for five years before that I was doing a sort of all-encompassing service anyway I was referring people to to lenders um, just so that they could buy properties that I could then manage mm. so it, it sort of it evolved really and then over the last 18 months I've started taking on a team of people to help make the most of these opportunities really so and now 978 bridging has become the kind of the chief brand for for all of it as well as it absolutely has yes um you know it's it's um I think it's a strong brand I worked closely with uh, with a very talented um graphic designer and um we sort of we, we made this the standout brand um it's been a massive networking opportunity, building that panel of lenders. Um, I've spoken to people, as I say, all over the world. I've managed to fund deals for people internationally. Um, and so it's been, it's, it's had a great organic reach. And because of that, it makes sense for that to be the, the sort of the leading, yeah. the leading brand. Um, it's also got the most staff in it. So, you know, there's, there's three or four people continuously talking about 978 bridging which which just sort of pushes it into that next sort of awesome. level well done and what's so fun about this is just last week we were talking to mark sefton who's a business consultant and he said exactly that you know you have an idea and then you ask the question what problem are you solving and that's really what what happened to you you know you had a problem people came to you you're like well all right i'll work that out <laughs> and then it's all just kind of come step by step. It's like, oh, you guys need money. Well, I'll I'll figure that out too then. And you just add it on. Well, that's right. Um, you know, I've I, I when I sat down to start my lessons business um officially, you know, properly, when after dabbling, I was like, I need I need some structure here. And I went to a local business advisor and said, look this is the business I want to create. And I said to him, I want a business that can buy property, that can refurbish property, that can trade property, that can source property, that can manage property. And he was like, you're mental. <laughs> Calm down, do one thing. He said, the letting side, you've already started it. You've got a little bit of a brand awareness locally. It's scalable, it's low overheads. And he, and he sort of, nailed me down to doing this one thing mm. which is not what I wanted to do but I stuck at it he was you know he's had 20 years in business and so I listened to him um 
and ultimately that's what I set I set to grow this bigger lettings business but as you say along the way you get pulled off in different directions um, and you have to adapt and find solutions to the problems and you know working for yourself it's you're only getting paid if you make something happen so it just naturally took me on this different um, course and by the end of it, I've actually got exactly what I set out to do when I sat down with that guy. And it's only since I brought all those pieces of the puzzle together about 18 months to two years ago that I've really felt the momentum picking up. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, deep down, I probably felt like I wasn't on the path that I intended to be on for most of that time. Right. But saying that I learned huge amounts um, by sticking to that one thing and learning that industry inside and out. So wouldn't change it but it's now that I'm doing what I set out to do it, it seems like it's growing a lot faster and a lot healthier that's great I've, I find it very interesting we see you know, there that is generally the two schools of of kind of maybe not so much of thought but of action you know you'll have the uh, the the more creative who want to create everything at once and and run out with you know all five parts of your business from day one. And then you have those who just want to focus on one thing, build that and then add on. I mean, you're the type of person who wants to create everything and do everything and have that wonderful synergy, but you went the route of building one at a time. Looking back, I mean, I know you say you wouldn't want to change anything, but but kind of recommending for someone else, would you recommend nailing down that first business now, as he said, and then expanding? Or would you recommend like just like see your vision and explode it all at once? <laughs> I think I think there's a lot of sense in in learning a craft and honing a single skill because then you can become an expert. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can become an expert faster if you stick to one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's all about balance. I would say don't go five ways at once but maybe have something that you're focusing 75 percent of your energy on and something else which you love which you can put 25 percent of your energy into as well and do it that way um because if you feel like you're working against yourself and you're forcing yourself just to do this one thing then that's not going to work at all um but you can definitely spread yourself too thinly uh, in property, there's so many different strategies that you can do. You know, you, you could you could easily waste a lot of time by trying too many different things. So um, I'd say you have to give something the majority of your energy to really get it going. Um, that's that's my personal opinion. I love that. I mean, that's something. I mean, we're we're all about action. Obviously, we love when people go out, take action, make things happen because that's that's the key. But at the same time, I see a lot of people kind of run around and and they'll start something over here and then they'll start something over there and they'll start something over there and nothing gets completed. And so I like that advice of, you know, doing one thing, but, but I like your little twist there to say like, well, if, if that's not really who you are, well, do something else on the side as well, just so you get that creative energy out, but at, but at least finish what you started and then build from there because it's easier to duplicate at that point. Absolutely. And I'd say another thing um, in terms of if you're exploring lots of different avenues, try and find partners, try and find partners who share your vision in in each different part of what you're doing, because that way you can share resources, you can share time and energy. And that might be a way of growing something a bit bigger and more more versatile, um, more quickly. And it's very difficult to find good people that share your vision that you want to work with. So if you can do it, then, uh, then make the most of it, get out there, meet people, talk to people. And, you know, one relationship clicking could just absolutely transform your, your career and your, you know, your property um, path way really. And you've really built a good, strong team there at uh, nine, seven, eight and, and the other business as well. Absolutely. And it's taken some time. It, you know, it must be four years that I've been trying to get people on board in various capacities, um, you know, from a part-time admin assistant to bookkeeper to someone who's going to do viewings and things. And I've tried lots of different ways of doing it. And I've brought a few people into the business and some of them haven't worked out. And it's all part of the process, though. It's all part of learning 
how to how to onboard people to make sure that when they start within your company they know exactly what you're expecting of them and they know what you're trying to achieve if you can get them to buy into your vision then and and you can offer them a fair reward for their energy and their efforts then you're on to a winner but it's such a difficult thing to get right you know um we we've interviewed i've interviewed well well over 100 people um over the past four years for various different roles and you get 30 minutes 45 minutes of someone telling you what they think you want to hear (laughs) it's not a good way of understanding whether or not they can bring value to your business for the next five or ten years and they can grow with you it's so tricky and that's what i come across time and time again when speaking to other business owners is you know the hardest thing to get right is the right people on board um it's um it's a mystery i'm still trying to solve but ultimately i look for shared values um you know i think that if we can share our outlook on those things and share our values, then the knowledge, you know, that can be passed on and that can be, that can be given. You can learn everything else, but if you're not on the same page morally, uh, then it's just never going to work. That's awesome. I love it. Uh, I think we will uh, kind of leave us off there. I think we got some very powerful advice. Thank you. Uh, would you like to leave our, our community with, uh, with like one good uh, big takeaway we can take or small takeaway for that matter? <laughs> well, all I would say is there is no substitute for action. Um, that phrase, that word itself is possibly overused in our circle, but there is no substitute. So if you want to achieve something, then don't be daunted by it. Put that message out there. Make sure you have clearly in your head where you want to get to. And it might look like it's a million miles away, but all you can do today is take one step. You know, you put one foot in front of the other and eventually you'll get to where you want to be. And there's no substitute. And it doesn't have to be a big, dramatic change that you make right now. You can literally go and read, you know, read for an hour on the subject that you're interested in. And that is a step closer to where you want to be. So um, ultimately, put one foot in front of the other and, and just keep walking forward. You'll get knocked side to side and side to side. But if you keep looking over there, eventually you'll get there, I'm sure of it. I love it. I love it. So how can, how can we connect with you after the call? If, if anyone in the community wants to reach out, what's the best way to get a hold of you or your team? Okay, so uh, we're on Facebook. Um, I'll share the 978 Bridging um, channel, really, because that's where most of our resources are at the moment. So if you look us up, 978 Bridging on Facebook, if you look for Simon Dast on Facebook or LinkedIn, Uh, You can get to our website, www.978bridging.com, or you can give us a ring, 01524-889-978. Of course, 978. That's awesome. Perfect. So, yes. So, if you need help with sourcing, with letting, with lending, with basically anything in property, 978 is there to help you out. Absolutely. Thank you, Daniel. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And I uh, hope to see you again soon, Simon. we Will do. All the best. You too. Take Bye. Care. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you got a lot of value from this interview with Simon, who literally has done everything in the property space. Now, I want you to stay tuned for next week's episode because it is very, very exciting. I mean, have you ever felt on your property journey that money could be a challenge? You know, wondered, how are you going to raise enough money for your next property deal? Well, our next guest, Mark Lloyd, is a very successful property investor and property teacher. He shows us his exact system for raising finance. It's a very, very exciting episode and one you definitely don't want to miss. So make sure you subscribe to the podcast so that you get a notification the moment the episode comes out. Now, I also want to remind you about the new feature, the ability to record your question and send it to us directly. So just go to the MomentumInvestingPodcast.com and you can now record 
your questions. So that's MomentumInvestingPodcast.com. You can record your questions, send it in to us, and we will be able to answer it on air asking one of our speakers how would they handle that situation or how would they answer that question. So get the answer to your question from the top experts in the industry. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode because money shouldn't be a problem and Mark will show you how it doesn't have to be.